All right, so we're here to talk about how to convince your boss to build interactive Christmas trees. But the talk should probably be how to let your boss build crazy shit. Because <laughs> uh, that's what this is. It's kind of crazy. You can see how it looks. This is not the actual tree that we had up. Uh, this is a short and condensed version, just special for y'all. Uh, but who's ready for a mean field presentation about Christmas trees? Yay. Yeah, buddy. All right. If you like the music before, it's from a buddy of mine at work. Uh, his SoundCloud's up here. Uh, check him out, Electro Bro. So it's July. Yeah. Nobody else is wearing some Christmas stuff but me. Yeah. Today is Christmas in July. Uh, so let's get this started. I bet there's somebody out there that still has Christmas decorations up. So I don't feel so bad. But uh, every year uh, since I started uh, at the company that I'm at now, which used to be Modia, now is Osmo, uh, I've tried to help decorate our Christmas tree. We had a, like a contest every year. And that's you know, where this come out of. So my name's David Bates. I'm uh, the head of innovation for Osmo. Uh, you can hit me up on Twitter. It's probably the best way, but pretty much at David Bates. I, I've got all the social medias there. So if you have questions or anything, hit me up afterwards. All right. So while the talk is about a Christmas tree, uh, and I will show you how the Christmas tree works and get into the nitty gritty of it, uh, that's a, the road to where I am now to where I get to just play with things and then you know, tell my bosses how you know, we can use them effectively or why they let me build Christmas trees. There's a long, long road to get there. So. Uh, Let's get started. So back in 2012, this is the uh, first thing that I kind of built for a company uh, that was, you know, outside of uh, just software development or uh, things like that. Uh, the company that I built this for was called RFMD. Let me, it plays, so let's play it. It was called Nerdia uh, and it was, this conference for engineers of the company to get together and share ideas and it was all internal but uh, you know the attendance to this conference had been declining over the years because it was real boring it was real dry it was you know like how do you remove deposits of gold from a GAN silicon wafer and they were you know kind of glazing over so I helped build this thing uh, which is a Sphero racetrack I don't know who all is in familiar with Sphero but this was the first year Sphero had been released at CES and I got to meet the guy that created it. Uh, so I was like, I'm gonna build this, you know, kind of gate that can do color sensing on it and tell who wins and has kind of a timer so the engineers can roll it around and, you know, have some kind of bedding going on out in the area. So it had Twilio and it, it was a crazy thing. But the success of this is what started me down this path. Uh, I built this one thing uh, and then every year after that, I tried building more and more things. So this was a huge hit and you know, attendance that year was, over, was through the roof and then attendance years after were still through the roof. Uh, so it, it worked. And that's a young me over there. That was probably a long time ago. So sometimes it takes guts to get this through, uh, just like that. Uh, it was a Fortune 500 company, and I had to ask for 40 remote control balls, uh, plus some, you know, uh, EV foam, plus some, you know, acrylic and servos. And this guy was like, you know, I'm asking the CMO for this, and he's like, Why am I giving you a couple thousand dollars? <laughs> what are you going to build? But after that, you know, after I explained that I was going to spark the engineer's interest in this. You know, he kind of agreed to it and we went with it. In parallel to this, in Charlotte, uh, there was a bunch of IoT enthusiasts and we'd all get together around Halloween and try to build the most badass pumpkin that we could, right? Uh, so the first year I did it, I had like a, um, a little talking tablet inside of it with a little, actually it was this speaker that I'm still using. Uh, it was a little speaker in it and you could talk to it through the tablet and I'd wait for kids to come up and I'd press the button, you know, to kind of get it to talk to it and it'd scare the heck out of them. And then I, you know, moved on to adding LEDs and then eventually, I don't know how, but it wound up uh, coming into fire. So this is the first fire test that I ever did with it. 
So this last pumpkin, it actually was controlled through Elasticsearch uh, and had an IoT control panel, and this uh, one up on the top left. Um, so you could just hit a button and it would actually talk to people. It would say uh, something like, watch out, here comes the flame, uh, and then it would you know, throw out a flame. And it actually got me on Adafruit and featured on Hackster.io uh, that year. The same year that I built that last pumpkin, I also built what was called Modia Tree. Um, and this was, this is a picture of Modia Tree through the window. It had a live stream and you could tweet colors to it and it would transition between multiple colors. Uh, so the last two tweets that were sent to it, the live stream had music playing over it. So I was trying a lot of different technologies out, you know, like YouTube live streaming. Uh, how to you know pull stuff in from Twitter, how to you know manage uh, people trying to hack it. So it even had a, a Raspberry Pi with a little touch screen. I was trying out Windows IoT Core uh, to where you could see the last two tweets, and I had it sitting down at the bottom so that people coming up could see the last two tweets that were sent to it. My favorite tweet of all was this one, and. Uh, this kid was so disappointed that he couldn't turn the tree black. I actually met his mother uh, later on, uh, but uh, we had to reply back to him and tell him that, you know, we'd already thought of uh, black as a non-color. <laughs> so we got a lot of uh, press about this tree. Uh, it was you know, pretty neat that you could tweet to it. It was something new in Blacksburg. Uh, nobody had seen something like this before. So we had like t color wars going on where two different companies were trying to change the tree over to their colors. Uh, we had the Hokies, which, uh, you know, Blacksburg is Virginia Tech. So we had them trying to turn it Virginia Tech colors. But I was really disappointed with that tree uh, and, and the trees that I'd built since then because we always would lose the Blacksburg Library, which all they had was a stack of books with a light on top of it. So I'd always lose to a book tree. I'm like, come on, I built this big thing and I still don't win the thing. So then I kind of got uh, out of trees and I built the Stranger Things wall, which if anybody was here last year, uh, I presented that here last year as well. Uh, and it, it represented, uh, I got the idea because I kind of thought that Twitter represented the upside down. You know, it's kind of a place where people can be nasty and kind of anonymous. You know, it's kind of reverse of here. Uh, so it's, but it, it's similar. Uh, so I thought it would be really neat if you could take things from that upside down world and bring it into life. Uh, and that's where I got the idea for the Stranger Things wall. Yeah, but the Stranger Things wall is when I learned about these light strips. I had known about them a little bit before that. Uh, but I'd never messed with them, and they're called NeoPixels or WS2812Bs. And what it is is individually addressable LEDs. So these are different from your regular Christmas lights where they all turn one color or two colors, uh, you know, but they're all the same color, or they alternate in between them. These were each one you could choose whatever color you wanted. So now we can talk about this year's tree. So we went round and round, you know, this year trying to be like, how are we going to beat this book tree? You know, uh, this book tree keeps winning every year, no matter what we do, but we want to build something awesome for the people. Uh, and we want to try out some new things. So let's, let's see what we can build. And a coworker of mine came up with this game called Drop Mix. And it's a game where you can lay different cards down on this pad and it'll change the beat or tone or speed of the music that it's playing. Uh, so, it was, it was a really neat idea that, you know, everything could be localized uh, and still have interactivity so people wouldn't have to have Twitter to actually talk to it. So, and of course they had a cool logo, so being a marketer and kind of uh, into that, we had to come up with a cool logo for it. Um, then we got to work, you know, we kind of spun around trying to figure out how we could do it. And every time we try to build one of these, or I get into one of these projects and I convince somebody, hey, give me some money and some time to be able to build one of these, they're like, oh, okay, you got two weeks. So we had no idea how we were going to do it. Uh, you know, we thought that we'd have this, you know, elastic 
uh, Elasticsearch server trying to you know hold down the different cards, maybe have an RFID reader, you know, that sent it up to the cloud and then the tree would respond to it somehow. Uh, but then they were like, oh, you have two weeks. So we were like, okay, we gotta, gotta get some parts in and start putting things together. And have you ever tried to order technical parts through a non-technical person? Uh, the person I sent to, you know, I tried to justify the need to have twinkle lights and I tried to explain what these were. So I was like, just search for WS2812B and find me the fastest thing that you can ship to me, right? So we took it uh, like any other architecture thing that we did and we whiteboarded it. We sat down, tried to figure out how it would work. Uh, we figured out the light patterns and you know the, how the tree server would work, uh, how everything would be broken apart. And uh, for a while, our uh, upstairs swarm area, this is our swarm area, kind of looked like this uh, for you know, probably the whole two weeks that we were working on it. Uh, during this process, we had things that we wanted to try out that we had convinced our boss, hey, if you let us try this out, we're going to figure out about these newer technologies. One of them was Feathers, uh, which is a Node.js kind of server uh, kind of like Express, but you can build APIs on it really quick, and we wanted to try it out. So what better way to try out something than, you know, on a Christmas tree? Uh, so we, we tried on the Christmas tree, and worst things worst, you know, we just have a tree with pretty lights and maybe no interactivity. So we always try to think of these things having a failure mode. So this was an actual footage of me working on the hardware. Um, we decided to use uh, ESP8266s uh, for the color sensors and most of the tree parsing um, just so that we could have these cheap boards and try them out. I've been playing with the ESP8266s for about a year, uh, wanted to incorporate them in there, wanted to run a web server on them and see how it would work. So this is the architecture that we came up with. So we have two color sensors. Uh, which are in the box over there in front of the tree uh, that talk to a ESP8266 and they transmit a color, an RGB value uh, over to what we call the tree server. The tree server takes that and turns it into light patterns uh, and that it can transmit to the tree parser. And the tree parser takes that and turns it into the timing signals that the WS2812Bs need in order to light up each pixel. So it's a, a complex thing to try to talk back and forth. And yes, we could have probably made it all run on one thing, but we were trying to figure out how to get all these things to talk to each other. Uh, and we you know, wanted to work on API design and stuff like that. The problem with the ESP8266 is there were 900 LEDs on it, each of them with an array of three imps. Uh, that we had to transmit, and it was just too slow to actually turn on the lights as fast as we needed them to. So if you could think about trying to parse a you know, 900 array JSON on a microcontroller that runs at 80 megahertz, uh, it, was, it was tough. Uh, we got it close. Uh, at, at the end, we transmitted just CSV uh, instead of a JSON structure, get rid of the overhead, tried to parse it with some regex, but it was still just too slow. So we went back and I've now got two Raspberry Pis on there, one that's the tree server and one that's the tree parser or the light parser. Uh, so the Raspberry Pi had plenty of speed, plenty of power and could control the lights. So uh, we kind of, at the last minute, redid it to that. And in the end, uh, it all worked out. Uh, you know, the tree worked, kids loved it. They came up and changed cards. We got them coming up to us and asking us how it worked. Um, everything was great. The only problem uh, with it was we, it wasn't a problem for the kids, but it was a problem for all our coworkers. Uh, we programmed in an Easter egg that it would play baby shark one tenth of the time. <laughs> but it turned out that our one tenth was every time. <laughs> uh, so. We had some uh, lashback from that. Let me show you. Yeah. So this is kind of what it looked like when it was playing uh, Baby Shark. 
we had a ton of uh, people talk back and forth on it. Yeah. <laughs> we, a lot of our uh, uh, teammates were like, okay, you got to stop with the baby shark. So we won this year. Uh, so our tree is on the left over there. Uh, and it would have been an absolute wonderful victory, except that the Blacksburg Library did not have a book tree. So I did not beat the book tree. Enough of baby shark, right? All right, so you've actually been seeing the error state of the tree all this time. Uh, this is uh, when the server's disconnected and nothing works. It's, it, we call this the rainbow tree. Uh, so it just shows a rainbow pattern over it. So what I'm gonna do now is try and actually fire up the server on the tree and show you how the color sensors worked. So bear with me for just a moment while we do a live demo, which is never a good idea. I don't know if y'all have your Wi-Fi on, but if you saw it, the Wi-Fi router underneath the tree is called Os Osmo Tree. And uh, so it's all closed, a closed system together. And I think this is the server. It will not go over there. <laughs> My terminal window does not want to go over there. All right, so let me just do this. All right, so I'm connected up to the Wi-Fi, to the tree. I'm gonna SSH, SSH into the uh, tree. Yay, so far so good. All right, and then we'll, actually I got a CD into the server. And then we'll start it up. So this is starting up the tree server. And you can see I already have two colors on it. So we're waiting on the tree parser to actually call out and get the latest array of, of lights and then it should start lighting up soon. Because the server's working. All right, yeah, there it goes. I don't know if you can hear it, but the music's coming out of this speaker. And so what happens is there's two color sensors in this box, and it may turn black for a second, but uh, they each light up and detect a new thing. Uh, when we had it out on display, we actually had Christmas wrap this box, but I needed to get into it, so no Christmas wrap for you. And you just took these paint samples and you put it over top of it, and it'll mix up the color. So I'm gonna try purple and a light blue. And as you can see, it kind of shows up pink. And then next time it reads this one, you should also see the values up there that it brings in. So the color sensor is actually patched to a endpoint on the server to tell it what color that it has. And then the color or the tree server turns that into an array of colors. So now if I want to, I can change it over to green for the pinkish color. All right, so that's how it works. You can come up and just swap the colors on it. Uh, it changes the colors and plays through songs uh, and has different light patterns. Now, wouldn't be a, a true code talk if I didn't get into the code, right? So of course we gotta have the declaration up at the top of dot, drop tree, some nice you know, coding standards there. Um, this is the Python script, and as you can see, it's not very big, that actually runs the light parser for the tree. And uh, really all that it does, uh, there's two, two modes to it. The first one is the error mode, which is the rainbow tree, 
and it just runs a rainbow function from Adafruit that was built into the library I used for this tree. Uh, and then the second is to just iterate through uh, the different the array of colors and just assign each one a color. So it's very simple uh, for this code. So you can see I have uh, you know, a while true at the end and this is the real bulk of code down here. Everything above that is just defining uh, different things. Uh, and it you know, requests lights from the light server and just loads into JSON, starts a pixel count, goes through the pixels and then says, you know, parses out the RGB value and then just says pixels.show at the end, sleeps for you know, a, a tenth of a second and then starts it all again. All right, so that's the actual Python for the tree parser. Then there's uh, the color sensors. The color sensors have a bit more code uh, mainly because we had to try different things to try to get the colors to match up really good. The color sensors themselves are very sensitive. Uh, so there was a lot of bit shifting to try to get the NeoPixels light to match the, the readings that we got from the color sensor. So I spent quite a bit of time trying different ways to match the colors uh, between them. If you think of like zero to 255 for R, G, and B, this thing can bring up luminance and uh, hue and all other kinds of stuff. So we had to try to do some math to figure out what best colors to match it to. Uh, and this this code is running on the ESP8266 is over there. It basically connects to Wi-Fi, uh, gets the raw data from the color sensors, then it calculates a temperature, calculates a late calculates the lux, sets an interrupt so that it turns off the light, uh, and then we go through and we parse that and uh, print out some debugging information and then we patch color and this patch color all it does is just uh, you know go to lights one or lights two and does a patch operation so that it just updates the color value and it just does this over and over and over again as fast as it can then there's the the songs themselves so the server that we set up we set up some routines like uh, spread the lights out from the center or change all the colors at one time or start from here and go there uh, so that we'd have ranges of colors to do it and that's how he's doing this kind of chasing pattern or you may see it spread out with one color but not the other um, and then so we had to set up timing for these songs so uh, you can see that the song this is the let it snow uh, snow song actually goes through and has a different patterns that it runs through for that particular song with offsets for the delay so when to run this pattern all right so that's that's all the code i promise when did you figure out the patterns for each song you just the we just sat down and was like we we think it should spread out from here to there it should change over a color at this point yeah so it's basically manual work for each manual work for each one. So there's only like four songs that this thing iterates through. Uh, and there's only like 30 second clips of each song. Okay. Um, so it's, it wasn't that bad, but it was, you know, just sit down and work on it. All right, let's see if we can go back to the mode we were, we were in. Nope. It'll take me just a second to get back back into it from the demo. All right. So it is it isn't all about winning. I mean winning was cool, don't get me wrong. But even with Modia Tree when we didn't win, it was still awesome to see people look at the tree, play with the tree, uh, and then not know how it works. You know, it's magic before you know how it works. And this is one of my favorite quotes from Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, the joy that I get out of it is seeing like a kid come up to the tree, put a card down, see it change, and then not know how it happened. It's just like, whoa, you just blew my mind. Uh, and the reason that Osmo lets me experiment with stuff like this uh, is because it allows me to play with new technologies without the fear of failure. Like I said before, if, you know, y'all saw the tree 
uh, in its failure state through the entire talk until I started up the server. It wasn't really bad. It was a nice tree. Uh, it is much cooler if you can finish it, but if I failed, I would just make the lights light up. You know, I wouldn't, and it would have still been a cool tree. So because of all of this, you know, I've learned about Elasticsearch. I've learned about um, color sensors and how to change hue values. We've learned about feathers and whether you should patch or post the light updates. Uh, we learned about a ton of things as we were creating this. Um, and I truly believe that if you, you know, apply smart people to great ideas, you create magic. And so that's, that's why I like doing these things. All right, so now back to the original point. How do you convince your boss to do stuff like this? And uh, I took a hard look back at all of the projects I did and how I convinced my bosses at the time, because it's been multiple bosses along with multiple companies that I've done this with. And what makes them say yes to me and no to other people? And so I found, I, I tried to take a hard look at it and see how it is. And so I want to leave you with these three things. You know, if you can successfully answer these three questions, you should be able to convince your boss to let you build just about anything. You know, the first thing is, how will it increase your knowledge? What APIs, what technology are you going to learn from this? Uh, the second one is, you know, how does it relate to work? So, I mean, how does this Christmas tree relate to work? Well, we use feathers uh, and a lot of our stuff now to build APIs because we were able to prototype it on this. And we have engineers who are familiar with the technology and like it because they tried it out in this setting. Now, if they'd have tried it out and not liked it, that'd have been great too. It would have saved the company a ton of headache in trying to bring up a new thing. You gotta love it when you get mean by your own tree. And then the third thing, you know, are there fringe benefits? So of course, Osmo is a small company in Blacksburg. Uh, we wanna enter, you know, get engineers and get content developers in. So having a tree out there with our name on it that's this cool uh, makes people think, you know, Maybe they'll let me work on cool stuff like that. <laughs> Although our job has nothing to do with Christmas trees. Um, but we do do a lot of cool engineering stuff. Uh, so we, we get them in the door that way. So I wanna, uh, you know, final, final slide here. You know, what are you gonna create? What will you make? You know, the boards that ran this thing are like $35 tops. You can get them, get the ESP8266s for five bucks off of Amazon. Uh, you can get a Raspberry Pi uh, for 35 bucks uh, and run it yourself and just play with it. I'm sure that coming up this Christmas, you know, you can wrap your tree in some lights and get grab my GitHub and just load it on there and play with it. Uh, I implore you to do that. And if you, you know, have something that you want to get off the ground, a new technology that you're trying to play with and you can't. Uh, quite figure it out, hit me up on Twitter. You know, uh, I have contacts with a bunch of people in IoT uh, that would love to help get these things off of the ground. So with that, thank you very much. It's been a Merry Christmas. <laughs>